Today is April 16, 2018. My name is Blair Williams, and I'm here today in the chambers of Judge Albert Maslin. So thank you for having me today. Good morning. What a pleasure to have you. Uh, the first thing I'll ask you is, uh, just uh, where, were you, uh, where were you born and raised? Born in Carlisle, uh, September 18, 1956, in the old Carlisle Hospital. Mm -hmm. Uh, where my father was born as well. He was the only one in his family, I think, to be born in Carlisle and raised in town as well. A little bit of time outside of town, but most of it, uh, most of my 61, almost 62 years have been here in Carlisle. And, uh, how did your uh, family, you said your, your father was the only one of his generation born in the uh, Carlisle mm -hmm. Hospital. How did your family get to Cumberland County? I'll try to give you the real quick sure. story. Uh, but basically, it was a connection with Dickinson College. In the early teens, 19, uh, not, not 20, yeah. in around 1913, 1914, the Methodist bishop, because Dickinson College was a Methodist-based school or Methodist-affiliated, uh, went down to Philadelphia to meet with my great-grandfather and said, uh, Frank, we need some more boys at Dickinson. So the next year, my great uncle started, Frank Jr., and then the following year, 1915, my grandfather started. Both of them left to uh, fight in World War I to serve, and uh, then in the early 20s, the factory was looking for a place to move out of downtown Philadelphia, so C.H. Maslin and Sons, started by my great-great-grandfather, moved from Philadelphia to Carlisle in the 20s because they knew it was a good area. They knew that they could spread out for a more of an assembly line production uh, instead of a three or four story building downtown Philly. And so they moved here. So it was really kind of Dickinson connection, got us into town and then got us back into town. So they, I guess my grandparents moved here in the mid 20s and my father was born in 1929. Okay. And do you know how your uh, family first became affiliated with the Second Presbyterian Church? Well, my, my grandmother was Presbyterian. As I just mentioned, yeah. my grandfather was Methodist. In fact, most of the Maslins were Methodist, and most of them went to Allison Methodist when they did uh, come into town. Uh, my grandmother was also a Democrat. My grandfather was a Republican. So I like to say they compromised. <laughs> so my family became Presbyterian Republicans. Mm -hmm. And depending on who I talk to, I can espouse all the virtues of one grandparent or another. So when they came to town, uh, they started attending Second Presbyterian Church uh, when it was down on Pomfret Street. And uh, obviously when I came around in 56, that's where uh, I was taken, that's where I was baptized and uh, have been a member ever since. Well so did your uh, grandparents meet in Carlisle, or...? No, actually, they met in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, okay. Uh, they, you know, both uh, from uh, Philadelphia, the Philadelphia suburbs. And, uh, you know, my grandmother didn't know anything about central Pennsylvania, more than that's where Dickinson was, where her, where her boyfriend was. And uh, I guess they were married in the, I'd say, I'd say around 1918, 1919, not long after... Not long after my grandfather came back, from, he served in the Navy uh, at the tail end of World War I. Um, and then you mentioned your father was born in 29. Right. Um, and then you were born in the, the 50s. All of which time the family had been attending Second Presbyterian? Or? Yep, all the time, attending uh, Second Press. Did you hear stories of some of the about Second Presbyterian growing up, or during those time periods, or? Uh, I can't really think of any. There, there probably are some good stories with my grandmother that I, I should have checked with my cousins on. Okay. See, my grandmother and grandfather died when I was very young. I was mm. about two years old uh, when my grandmother died, about one year old when my grandfather died. Uh, so I, I don't even remember them. I, I can look at pictures mm -hmm. of me in the basement of their house and I can see pictures when I was baptized and kind of know that, yeah, there's, there's my grandmother, but didn't have any stories. But my grandmother, who was nicknamed Mammy, 
probably was more colorful than uh, my grandfather, and I imagine she probably had some some colorful discussions with the clergy. I don't I don't know for sure, but I can can imagine. And what about uh, from your parents' generation, sort of their early experiences with the church? Well, my mother met my fa my father at Dickinson, another okay. Dickinson connection, and she came from an Episcopalian background. Hmm. Uh, so this was new to her, the Presbyterian Church. I mean, not totally new, but uh, a little bit different than what she was used to in, in the Anglican setting. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot ne less kneeling uh, than, than they do in uh, the Episcopal Church, which is, was interesting because uh, when uh, my mother passed away in, in 1999, I can remember the one pastor talking about how he'd come into church uh, on our Garland Drive uh, church and my mother would be there for 8 o'clock service but my father was always at everything early so probably 7.45 they were there and he would see my mother occasionally kneeling in the back saying some prayers before the start of service uh, she hadn't been an Episcopalian for a long time but couldn't quite take that out of her now, interestingly, not to jump too far ahead but my wife, uh, mm -hmm. Debbie uh, also had an Episcopalian background, uh, so my father and I both mar married Episcopalian Dickinsonians, uh, and talked them into becoming Presbyterians. I don't, I don't. My, my wife doesn't kneel in, in back like my mother did too much, but. Uh. Well, you mentioned too that uh, your uh, you first started attending Second Presbyterian when it was on Hanover Street. Right. Do you have any recollections of the church on Hanover Street? I do. Uh, you know, we were there probably till I was about 13 or so. I forget exact. Now, maybe a little bit older. Uh, maybe 16 is when I think we moved. Uh, I had gone away to a prep school in New Jersey at 13. So, I, I, you know, at that point, I was a little bit out of town. But uh, I, I went through confirmation class at the old uh, the old church where Salvation Army is now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can remember the Sunday school room downstairs and the Sunday school room upstairs. I can remember, uh, you know, being in uh, the nursery. I can still visualize the felt Jesus character board. You know, mm -hmm. we had the felt Jesus and the sheep and everything sticking on there. So I have a, you know, a lot of early childhood memories. I, I can't remember. I can remember running around and playing hide and seek at times. But, uh, you know, I, I, I do remember uh, the first sermon that uh, Reverend Ferguson, uh, Mike Ferguson, gave, and I want to say that was in the the late '60s, maybe '67, '68. I know I was maybe 11 or 12 at the time. And I can remember being there for that. And then they excused him, and then they voted. And I thought that was quite interesting how they had to, to vote to approve him. But uh, it was a it was a really uh, over, overwhelming landslide. But, yeah. Um. I do remember. Actually, I remember uh, sometimes Sunday morning in the summer. Uh, if we'd been good kids, uh, you know. And this is, I guess, maybe I was 10, 11, 12. Uh, my, my parents would let us walk home. Okay. Uh, we lived on Hillside Drive then, which wasn't too far. Uh, and I guess maybe we did it when we moved over to Glendale Court. But, uh, you know, my sister and I usually would, uh, younger sister, older brother, wasn't always around. But in any event, we would, we'd walk home from church. And uh, we'd get to stop and get some candy somewhere at the... I think one of the little soda fountain places was open. Not many places were open on a Sunday, but I know that we'd, we'd do that. I can remember my mother entertaining me in the back of the church when I was younger and didn't really want to listen. We'd play hangman uh, and uh, yeah, try, to keep me, try to keep me quiet. I guess that worked fairly well. But sometimes they, they sent us home, so I can remember having fun just walking home with my, my little sister. I don't know that people would do that today. Everybody gets a little bit uptight yeah. about that, but there was no concern walking down Hanover Street or South Street and uh, walking on a, on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 
that's a, another memory, not so much of the church, but... Uh, yeah. Well, I'm just saying, were you, were you still, so you were away at school when the church decided to move from Garland to... Right. Or from Hanover to Garland? Right. I was, I was in a prep school in New Jersey, basically in 1971, graduated in 74. Now, I'd be home. You know, yeah. So I, I knew that there were some challenging meetings. I knew that uh, a lot of people got a little hot under the collar and didn't want to be a church outside of town, wanted to be a downtown church. Uh, frankly, as, as it is in all these situations, some people just probably didn't want to pay for it. You know? It's cheaper to stay where you are than it is to have a big building fund and build a new church. So I'm sure there's always a little bit of that. And the move out of town is, uh, I would have to say, an excuse. Don't worry, I'm not going to name any names. I've heard a few, though, believe me. Uh, but I, my, my uncle, uh, Bill Maslin, William Maslin, uh, was, I think he headed the building committee. He and Bud Gardner, who also worked at Maslin's yeah. at the time, uh, they were active in the building committee and know that that was that was a real challenge but it was a tough time uh, but I think I think in the long run the church made the right decision well, just, do you remember uh, your parents feelings on the matter like did they discuss with you or your uh, siblings what, what? you know I, I, I remember them talking about it they they were always in favor of the move they you know and this is a church again that my dad grew up in mm -hmm. so if, if somebody uh, would have objection to it because of the roots and the nostalgia I have to say my dad would have been in in that category yeah uh, but he was he was ready to make the move he thought it was the right thing to do I think he was a trustee at the time and I imagine he was somehow involved in the building committee activities but I mm -hmm. I don't remember precisely what I do remember my uncle uh, heading that up though yeah um it sounds like I you, you did have family also attending the church. Sure. Uh, sort of what, what role did the church play in your family's sort of social life? Well, that, that, that's a good question. I, you know, uh, our, our family is a kind of big family, and not everybody went to uh -huh. uh, Second Presbyterian Church. I mean, uh, they're, they're, we still have some of those Methodists in our family. I mean, <laughs> go figure, after all these years. But no, seriously. So it was... It was big, really, mostly my dad and his uh, one brother. I, another brother, another uncle was up in Boston. I had another aunt who was out of town. But of those, of those cousins, we, uh, we attended the church. We grew up in the church. The, the real activity, though, I'd have to say, the youth club and a lot of those things, that came after the move. That came yep. after Mike Ferguson. Uh, Mike and Jackie uh, came on board and and instituted a lot of that. I can remember uh, going on uh, retreats and going on like like night you know day camps or something or not uh, you know, maybe overnight camp is the best way to say it, like family retreats and I forget where we went whether whether it was up in Michaud or some other local area campground uh, not big church camp type things or. And I don't remember a large youth group in the old church. Uh, that, again, that probably is something I'd have been more active in uh, had I not gone away to school. Um, I know that shortly after, uh, maybe not shortly after, but after the, the Fergusons came, and I think just before the move to the new church, there was a sort of like interpretive movement or something that. Sure. Was yeah. your sister involved with that, or no? She she was anything? too young for that. All okay. of all of the girls, you know, I probably had a crush on at least half of them, if not all of them. They're all these beautiful girls holding yeah. candles and doing these movements and everything. And that I think I, I'm pretty sure it started in the old church. Yeah. There was a little bit of that. Uh, I don't remember a whole lot. I can you know visualize them kind of going down the aisles and things, but. Uh, that's when you had the uh, the Johnston girls, uh, I think like Sandy Drips, maybe the Rogers girls, some other folks uh, who were active in that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, you know, I do remember that, but 
Now Mimi, uh, my younger sister, is, was too young for that at that time. Was she old enough to eventually take part in some of the uh, performances in youth <coughs> club that uh, Jack Larson and maybe the oh, Larsons yeah. were playing Oh yeah, on? she was involved in Cool in the for Furnace and some other things. And I have to say, when I was in law school, uh, I got active in the church at that time. Uh, Were you at I, Dickinson my, Law? My, I was at Dickinson School of Law, okay. and uh, I, I'd have to say that my faith was at, at, at least renewed and rejuvenated. I had a lot of head knowledge uh, for a, a long number of years, and I, was, I, I would be pretty good at telling you, you know, how, how long ago Moses lived and what Moses did, all these facts. I'd have been good on uh, Bible Jeopardy for teenagers, uh, but I didn't have a strong faith, I would say, until law school. Maybe law school drove me. <laughs> yeah. Dro drove me to it. Uh, in, in any event, uh, uh, I got active then. I went in to see Mike Ferguson and said, I'd like to help out. And the next thing you know, I'm teaching fourth grade youth club. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stuck with youth club. And then eventually I got, I got involved with more of the high school stuff and was in a couple musicals myself. I was in uh, our Godspell version. I played the, the Jesus role in that. But before that, uh, we had Joseph and his amazing Technicolor dream coat. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the brothers in that. I think I was brother number nine or something. Gad, I think I was Gad. I don't know. I didn't, I just sang chorus and that. So that was a lot of fun. My sister though, had been involved in I think Cool in the Furnace, or maybe Noah's Flood. She was in, in Noah's Flood. Uh, actually, there was one about the prodigals uh, that Jack Larson wrote. And I remember I, I played the guitar for that. Not a very good guitarist, but I was good enough. I could, I could play the rhythm guitar. So that, that one I think we actually did in the, in the upper rotunda, which was kind of an mm -hmm. awkward place sound-wise, musically. Uh, so yeah, I, I know Mimi was involved in youth club. She was involved in youth club, uh, and and I know she was in, probably in one or two of the musicals as as a little kid. Was there something about I guess being more involved with the church or sort of the youth that that I'm trying to think of the way to phrase it that you found interesting or that really spoke to you in some way? Well, it was just it. it, it I would say exciting times mm -hmm. uh, because there were a lot of kids. There were kids that were curious about, you know, their faith, uh, curious about uh, getting to know Jesus, getting to know the church, you know, getting to know each other. It was a social outlet, so it was really, really a place to go. And a lot of the kids back then, as I recall, I don't know if I should say a lot, but a fair percentage uh, were not members of the church or their parents weren't members of the church. Mm -hmm. They were coming there because there were, there were kids there and there was an excitement level. And, mm -hmm. and frankly, uh, you know, back in the 70s, 80s, uh, maybe into the 90s, but certainly in the 80s, there weren't that many competing activities. Uh, you didn't have youth soccer every day of the week in the fall and the spring. Mm -hmm. You didn't have all the other activities. Uh, so Wednesday night youth club, Kirk night as we call it, uh, was, was a really happening place. So that was exciting. That was exciting for me, as I say, as my faith was rejuvenated in law school. It was exciting to be part of that. You've spoken a little bit about, uh, sort of, you mentioned, do you remember uh, Mike Ferguson's first sermon and a little bit about uh, Jack Larson? What was it about the two? Are, are there any other significant memories uh, about the two of them that you remember or that you stand know, out to you? This well, it, it, uh, trying not to be too emotional, but you know, Jack and Mike just had this uh, great connection. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm sure you've heard about it from other people. They, they pretty much knew, you know, what the other was thinking. And, you know, this is during service, services, and, and not during service. I mean, they were a great duet. I, hearing them sing the wedding song, I probably heard it, a, you know, not a hundred times, but many times. Love that. Uh, them, you know, Mike, uh, Mike singing the Lord's Prayer. Uh, 
you know, just having a pastor that would just start singing and Jack would be ready to play along. And so it was, uh, it, it was neat. But, you know, they connected on, on, on so many different levels. I think I'd, you know, to try to, I should have maybe tried to think of some uh, good examples. I'm sure you've gotten others, but, uh, you know, just they had that, that great bond, you know. And Jackie was part of that too. Uh, you know, she, uh, you know, still her and Jack today, uh, you know, have that, that special bond without Mike around, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, it was it was perfect. I, you know, was a little aside about, uh, you know, Mike, after he had his cognitive mm -hmm. problems, uh, I, I, I can still remember in the one uh, Monday Thursday service, the Tenebrae service, uh, service of light, service of shadows, at the end of that service, we traditionally sang, uh, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And uh, one year, I, I, I forget who was singing it. It was a solo. It might have been Andy Hoke. And at that time, Mike, who again was having cognitive problems and probably wasn't able to communicate very well at all about anything with too many people other than family, my recollection, I don't know the timing. Uh, but he just stood up and started singing along. Mm. You know, that's, which, you know, is an instance in, you know, I know music has a lot of triggers, positive and negative, but certainly positive. But I just, you know, just sense the spirit moving him mm. at that time. Uh, well, I mean, just looking around your office here, I'm seeing a lot of family photos, and I'm wondering, did you get married at Second Presbyterian, or? No, my wife is from New Jersey. Okay. Uh, we got married down there. Had a good good crew from Carlisle down there. It was uh, a fun celebration. I'm pretty sure the Fergusons were there, uh, but it was uh, it was a nice uh, nice event down there. But not not in town. Now, of our of our kids, uh, our the first wedding for our middle child Sarah took place at the church. Uh, the second wedding for our son was down in Fredericksburg. His wife is from down in, in Virginia. And the third one, actually, I did at Allenberry for our daughter. Uh, but we had Jeff and Jennifer uh, in, in attendance for that. Um, and uh, after uh, Mike retired, uh, uh, Jack Gilchrist came. Do you have Jim. Yeah. Jim Gilchrist. Sorry. That's okay. Have a lot of Jacks, a lot of Jims, yeah. a lot of Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I was, uh, you know, I, I was uh, honored to be on the pastor nominating committee. Okay. So uh, you, you may have spoken with a few other members of that committee, but it was, it was a great process, challenging process. This is, you know, pre a lot of technology. <laughs> so we, I think we had cassette tapes of sermons and maybe VCRs and, uh, we tried to do one Skype type interview, but we had to go to a Ginkgo's or Kinkos or whatever it was, and it was like, you know, that was the only place you could do it. It was it was crazy, and it didn't work out real well either. The guy didn't come across over that lousy video feed well. Uh, but uh, other folks had gone to see Jim in person, and I did too. And you know, you kind of sneak in the little church in New Jersey and say, "Oh, this guy's pretty good. We ought to bring him here." Uh, and do a candidating process. And so, I, you know, he, he, was, he was clearly the best of the bunch, and we had some good people uh, uh, to review. So I was, again, happy to be on, on that team. Uh, great, great people on the team, Taylor Andrews, Bob Beard, Jenny Boynton, Peter Alexander, Marion Johnston, Sally Chant, and I, uh, Dick Kalman, you know, we had a lot of really, really good people. So it was a, again, I hope, hope I didn't forget somebody, but I probably did. Have you during um, during your time at Second Press, have you served on any other um, committees or trustees yeah, or anything? I, like I was a deacon early on. I say early on, probably 
uh, within a couple years after got married in 1980, I, you know, I know he was involved with deacons for a term, and then right around 29, 30, I know, uh, when I was 29 or 30, uh, not 19, 20. <laughs> but in any event, I, I know that I, I was on session for the first time back then. Uh, and I was, uh, I served, I, I want to say three, maybe four terms on session uh, since then, and uh, been been very rewarding. Uh, some of that as clerk, some not as clerk of session, but uh, great great group of guys. It was you know when I was first on, obviously as like a thirty year old, uh, I was a young guy, very very young. We didn't have a whole lot of people, you know, even near thirty. Uh, so there were some certainly some senior folks like Phil Lockhart in particular who I. Uh, would look to to uh, to learn from. Uh, um, and then, were there any issues or items that you remember having to deal with over over those terms? Or uh, you know, I know some of the first oh, the first term. I, I think we were more interested in uh, well uh, church growth type issues. Mm -hmm. I, I went to a conference. Uh, with Mike Ferguson on that down in southeast Pennsylvania. I remember I went out to St. Louis maybe in that first term on session for a, uh, a Presbyterians for Reform uh, movement. And it was, uh, it was an interesting one. It, 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 I, I, I can't recall if that was sponsored by, by the National Church, and I forget whether we were forget what our initials were back then but uh, you know it was a, it was a good challenging experience but you know in, in other sessions on session other terms on session you know we had to deal with uh, abortion and health care issues uh, I, I was not on the board when there were ordination and homosexuality issues. I was on there one time, but it was really pretty much kicked forward uh, to the next term. So I didn't have to deal with too many of the, the hot button issues, but I, you know, I, I've dealt with them from off session as just a member. And, and I think we've done a pretty good job of working through them. It's not to say that there aren't times when you know, somebody is personally offended one way or the other uh, by a position that sometimes that the, the church takes as a whole or sometimes as the congregation takes. Uh, but I think we've done a pretty good job of working through those. Um, so you, those are kind of national issues. I'm wondering, do you remember any uh, being involved in any community issues uh, through the church or your work with the church? Maybe that the church took a stance on? Uh, you know, the church has been involved with a lot. You know, it, it's it's sometimes hard for me to think of uh, the church in some ways separate from the community. Mm -hmm. uh, because when I think of every community organization in town that I've been involved in, there have been other people from Second Press involved. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the, the Chamber of Commerce or Project Share, or Samaritan Fellowship, uh, there's always been a, a number of people from Second Press involved. So I, I haven't always viewed it as something that, well, we do something here at Second Presbyterian Church, and then they do something there over at Samaritan Fellowship. I, I've kind of seen it as something that, that we're involved in whether it's, you know, Carlisle Cares, and I know there's a, a number of other things that uh, the church has been active in, uh, some more specifically from the church than others. Uh, but I think our church has always been good at uh, being active in, in what's going on around town. Um, and then, jumping back a little bit, um, are there uh, any particular things about Pastor Gilchrist that st still stand out to you, you know, 20 well, years after he's left? Yeah, you know, I, I love Mike. Or no, and, I'm, and, and, no I'm, I'm, I'm backing up. I'm, oh, I'm one of these sorry. old guys. I back up. So I can't answer your question. Sure. You know, but, but Mike's approach was different than Jim's approach. Okay. 
Mike had notes, I'm sure, but it was like he was kind of more of a stream of consciousness in many ways, not that there was an organization. And looking back at, at a Bible I was given when I was first elected to the State House in 1992, and I had that Bible, I guess I got it in 93, and I, I took a lot of notes in the columns, and great notes, great input uh, from, from Mike throughout the years, loved his sermons. Jim was different. Jim had, you know, you could almost see the outline as he was preaching. He, not that he didn't have the spirit moving him. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the spirit moves you when you when you write out or type out on a computer uh, your sermon as much as it does if you handwrite it or if you just pray about it before you go in the pulpit. And 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 Jim's sermons were excellent. Uh, you know, it was one of those things where. You know, we knew he was so good that we kind of hoped that he'd be around longer, but we knew that that was unlikely to happen. Some big church somewhere uh, was going to was gonna nab him. And he, interestingly enough, since I talked about Methodists early, he started off with the Methodist congregation and then came over to the, the Presbyterian side. But that's a, that's a long story I won't bore you with. But his sermons were, were excellent. They, you know, it was one of those things where where do you start taking notes and where do you stop taking notes? And I'm a, I'm a note taker. Uh, but I, I, I've saved some of his. I still uh, pull some of them out on occasion. Uh, uh, one of my favorites that uh, you know I think was one of his candidating sermons, or maybe it's one that I saw in New Jersey when I went to visit, was The Other Nine. Uh, and that was about the... Uh, the 10 lepers who were healed by Jesus. And only one came back to thank him. You know, the other nine went about doing whatever they were doing. So it was an interesting look at that. Now, what about the other nine? Uh, you know, so I, that, that was, uh, th there were many memorable ones, but that one stands out. But he was also really good in the community. You know, he got us started on Alpha. He came up to me one of the times I guess I was on session, and said, we want to start the Alpha program. I said, oh, great. What's that about? He said, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I want you to do it. I said, okay, great. And he says, uh, well, Shirley Johnstone will help. Okay, that's good. You know, so, so Shirley and I trooped off to Shippensburg to see how they ran the Alpha program, which is a, a Bible study type thing. It's more than that. And so we did it because Jim said, let's do this. I think it'll work. And it actually worked really well. So I've, I've, I've tried to always be open to my pastor's mm -hmm. ideas, whether it's been Mike or Jim and now Jeff, if they have, you know, suggestions, a, a way they want to go with something, I'm, I'm usually going to be on their bandwagon. Well, speaking of Jeff, I, I met him for the first time last week. And I know it seems like, his background, it seems, is very similar to uh, uh, Pastor Gilchrist, but maybe a little bit different personality. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit about some of the memories of, of Jeff over the past decade or so. Well, they're you know they're they're all different mm -hmm. personalities. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't really compare them. I, I would say uh, Jim might have been more of I hate to say contemplative, but in contrast, he might have appeared more of the thoughtful person, uh, not so much one who's ready to to grab the flag and say, "Follow me, boys!" You know, into battle. Uh, Jeff's more the one to grab the flag, which is kind of like Mike Ferguson in many ways. And Mike would just grab the flag. In fact. One of my earlier memories of Mike and Kirk Knight was playing capture the flag or kick the can or whatever out there on the big yeah. field. And uh, he, he was tough. <laughs> you wanted to be on his team. Yeah. You know, but uh, no, you know, and, and, and Jeff, is, Jeff is more like that. Uh, whether you say he's, he's more dynamic, he's maybe, maybe a little bit more uh, outgoing uh, than Jim. Very good sermons as well. They, you know, we've we've really been very fortunate in in that respect to have 
pastors who are, are good in the pulpit, uh, but you need pastors that do something more outside the pulpit, obviously, for the, uh, for the church to, uh, to be healthy. And, uh, you know, there are obviously challenging times now in the church, as I think in all mainline churches. And, and Jeff's, you know, uh, working his, his darndest on it. Um, so, I, so we're now at the point where I, what I call like the metaphysical questions. Okay. And it, you mentioned that uh, during law school, uh, your faith was kind of mm -hmm. rejuvenated. Right. I'm wondering, was, was maybe not at that point, but maybe later or before, was there a time when faith played a particularly strong role in your life or that helped you in some way? Well, there have been a, a number of times that it has. Uh, you know, it's... I, I would have to say in, in my high school, college years, I was probably more agnostic than anything. Uh, I, I would never put myself in a category of, uh, you know, having been an atheist. Uh, nothing against atheists, but I think that takes a whole lot more faith than it does to believe in God. You know, to believe that there's, abs to absolutely unequivocally believe that there is no God, that's, that takes a lot of faith. Uh, so I was more of an agnostic. Uh, and, you know, it, obviously coming back to the church and being involved in youth club and Kirk night and being involved in Godspell, uh, that was a very uh, powerful time. But I, I guess, you know, maybe one of the, you know, in terms of when I, I needed support, I, I remember, uh, you know, some challenging times when I ran for judge. And it wasn't always a positive campaign, uh, regretfully. Uh, and I, I was coming under attack. And it was a very difficult time. I, at, at that time, uh, Jennifer McKenna was, was very helpful, uh, as was Jeff. But I can, I can remember Jennifer in particular uh, during some times when uh, when her, she didn't preach a whole lot, but her sermons and, and one retreat uh, that I went on were just uh, perfect timing, uh, perfect timing. Yeah. And, and interestingly, I was actually on my way to a retreat in December of 2008 before I ran in 2009, and uh, I, I was going to use that retreat as, uh, as a time to really pray and contemplate whether I should run for judge. Thought I should, I was ready to run, but I wasn't completely sure. And I said, you know, uh, sometimes God, I think you need to hit me with a two by four. Well, he did in a different way. Uh, on the way to the retreat, somewhere outside Reading, I, I got T-boned mm -hmm. in my car, had a concussion, had no idea where I was. Uh, once I finally figured that out and calls were made, I was taken to the hospital. My wife and oldest daughter, Sarah, arrived at the hospital, but so was Jennifer. She was there, too, because she was at the retreat center in Orwigsville, somewhere in Berks County, I think, mm -hmm. and came back to Lebanon, which was near where I was uh, involved in the accident. I was okay, other than you know, the brain. I think I'll, I'll be okay, but that, that was a particularly meaningful time having her there and then as as the campaign progressed support from her support from other people in the church uh, was, was very very helpful and I say support in a in a you know a non-material mm -hmm. way the, the prayers the encouragement uh, was uh, very very helpful yeah you know you mentioned you know Kind of hearing things at the right or the moment when you needed to hear it. I, I felt right. even in my my life, you know, that's happened. You know, you, you know, you're down on something. You know, something bad's happened to you, and you go to church, and yeah. it seems like this sermon that week is meant just for you. It's, yeah, yeah. No, I've had I've had I've had many of those. I mean, of course, there's also sermons every now and then. You think, well, I hope the person next to me is listening to it. But if you're thinking that, eh, it probably means you need to listen to it too. Yeah. <laughs> 
I, you know, I think you, we probably discussed this, this question too over the course of our conversation, but how, how has your faith uh, journey sort of influenced your life over the years? Uh, had a, you know, it, it's had a huge impact. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, my time in the state legislature, uh, running for Congress, and some other positions over in Harrisburg, uh, there are times when I was, you know, under the gun over there. I can remember uh, being Inspector General uh, for Governor Schweiker at the time, who took over for Governor Ridge, and we had to make some employment personnel decisions, uh, which resulted in me being sued in a federal lawsuit, which uh, was a challenging time. Ultimately, that was dismissed, but again, at that time, uh, our, our associate pastor, uh, Julianne Pugh, now Julianne Whipple, uh, had, had given me this uh, devotional uh, that, again, was perfect timing, having received that devotional. And that helped me get through a kind of a difficult, dark period. When my mother died, uh, being able to sit down and talk with Jim Gilchrist and going through the, the challenges during that dark period. Uh, you know, there's just been multiple times when uh, the church has been there. And then uh, maybe just uh, kind of wrapping up a little bit. Um, you gotta be careful. You gotta tell me when you're wrapping up because otherwise I'll go on for another hour. I mean, no, no, no. It's, uh, <laughs> Obviously, I mean, there have been a, quite a few changes since you first started attending Second Presbyterian and mm -hmm. going back even further, your family started attending sec, Second Pres. But what are, aside from maybe the church moving and sort of the, you know, the pastors and some of those, are, are there any other significant changes you've, you've seen over the years? You know, there have been a lot of changes. I, I, I hesitate how to answer this. I, I remember the, the story uh, of the clerk of session who had been a clerk of session in another church, un, to be unnamed, for 30, 40 years. And a new member came up to the clerk and said, during those 30, 40 years, I'm sure you've seen many changes. And he said, I have and I've opposed every one. Well, I don't want to be like that. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't opposed. I, you know, but there, uh, although there have been changes, I, you know, still seeing familiar faces and the continuity, mm -hmm. uh, I don't, the changes don't, uh, I know we need to change. I know we need a new service here, a contemporary service. We need to do something for people who, don't understand what church is because there's a lot of people younger than me and other in my kids generation who never went to church as kids so you don't hand them a hymnal and expect them to know what to do with it they don't know that tune they don't know that tune at all so uh you know i i think it's trying to still be relevant trying to still be mm -hmm. fresh still be you know still be true to the gospel while still uh, being relevant is, is the biggest challenge. I think we've met that. You know, I, uh, I think that our pastors have always been willing to try new things. And, uh, you know, I see that now even with just Vacation Bible School. It's going to be different this year. And, you know, part of me in the back pew yesterday is saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. What are you doing? You can't change Vacation Bible School. They've got to do that the same old way with the little popsicle figures, popsicle stick figures. Don't you do that every year? Well, no, you don't have to do that. So it's going to be different this year. We're going to get Camp Chrysland folks to come in, and I think that's a, a, a great idea. So you just you have to be uh, willing to say, you know, there have been so many changes in the church over all these centuries uh, let's not get too hung up over it. Let's just keep moving forward. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. It's been great. Thank you, Blair. Thank you.